so humanitarian innovation. Um, the sort of starting point for this is that um, initially just about everybody lived in what you might call the developing world. Um, this was the developing world three, four, five hundred years ago and then we went through a process of developing and our world changed radically. So we now live 20, 30, 40 years longer than people in much of the rest of the world and those people are defined as the developing world. Um, the notion that development is a process that we ourselves went through relatively recently is something that's often left out of the dialogue. Uh, and this has you know, links to things like colonialism and the history by which we managed to develop. It wasn't just a series of technological breakthroughs. So right now, every year of all causes, about 60 million people die. 60 something million are born, 60 million die, and this is life. The tricky part is that 20 million of the people who die, which is roughly a third of all death, is death from poverty. And this is not simple single issue death. It's uh, a set of things that I call the poverty cluster, where you've got a set of things which interact, where people are working too hard, they don't have proper medical care, they're exposed to you know, waterborne disease, and as a result, they die 10, 15 years uh, younger than they would have otherwise. Um, you can see this kind of thing particularly in children. Infant mortality is a wide variety of causes, and these systems interact. So most of this death is preventable death. Uh, because we don't have these problems, we found a way of preventing these deaths. Reasonable? Right. So um, this is the permanent disaster. Poverty is like a natural disaster, but it's running all the time over most of the planet. And basically, there are six things that people die of. They are too hot and too cold, hungry, thirsty, ill, or injured. And this is pr most of what happens. Uh, hunger and thirst are typically um, supply issues. You've got to grow the food, you have to bring the water. Um, hot and cold are shelter issues, insufficient housing, insufficient clothing. And illness and injury, illness is largely public health, and injury is substantially violence with a few accidents thrown in. Uh, there are times when you have very bad years for injury, like the Rwandan genocide. A substantial percentage of all the people who died in the year of the Rwandan genocide died in the genocide. Something like 4 million people were killed, 60 million died of natural causes. So that year, a f you know, 4%, actually more, 8% of the people who died in the world died in that genocide. This stuff is really, really serious. So what protects us from these kinds of causes here is infrastructure. And if you think about your house, your house is actually a very sophisticated machine. And it's a termination point for trillions of pounds worth of services. So you have water that comes out your taps, and that's connected to water pipes. And the water pipes are connected to water purification plants. And they're connected to electrical engineers and chemical engineers and the industrial supply chain. They're connected to municipal financing and the government. And this entire set of systems maintains your water supply. It maintains your sewage supply. Um, all of this kind of stuff is infrastructure, but this kind of stuff is not easy to roll out in the developing world. We're not going to rebuild Victorian London's sewer system in Mozambique. Not the way this is going to work. Um, oh, we seem to have gone forward. One. Can you go back one slide? Thanks. So if you think about this model, um, then apply it to these infrastructures, what are the big killers? We've heard a little about water. We've heard a little about stoves. Sanitation is another huge issue. Um, improved farming, handling the food supply issues is several million lives a year. Uh, World Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that malnutrition is a factor in something like half of all death globally. Right? And there are relatively simple fixes for the vast majority of these problems. Agriculture, there's an outfit called One Acre Fund, which is operating in Africa, which has a one-year training program where they go to your farm and they come around at harvest time and they come around at planting time and they come around with uh, a training course and they'll double your food production and half your infant mortality for you. And they've got about 14,000 farms they're doing this on right now. So radical breakthroughs are possible in all of these areas and we could be talking about saving 10, 15, million lives a year. That's a quarter of all human death. And this is a big deal. So why isn't it done yet? Given that this is possible, and given that the costs are often in the region of 
50 to to $100 per household for the entire package, why hasn't it been done everywhere? Um, in 2003, uh, The Economist published a book called Small is Profitable, which is about electrical infrastructure. And Small is Profitable <coughs> discusses how you evaluate the efficiency and the cost of an electrical grid. And it goes through about 400 pages of things like portfolio theory and load shape matching to the come to the conclusion that the big problem that we have is accountancy. That the accounting practices which are standard in the energy industry very poorly reflect the value of services like solar panels and wind generators because the solar panels and the wind generators generate the power directly on top of the consumer who needs it and the efficiencies from doing the a system where you put the production and the consumption close to each other aren't accounted for in the standard models. So if you want to provide, let's say, electricity to Egypt in, let's say, 1960, you wind up with the Aswan Dam, which costs some hundreds of millions of dollars and screws up their agricultural ecosystem for generations. Right? What they really needed at that point was maybe a little power in a lot of places rather than a lot of power in a few places. And this is this long tail thing that what we're talking about is a long tail approach to providing infrastructure for the developing world. Household by household, individual by individual, village by village. Um, why is that difficult? It means managing the capital that goes into these investments in a completely different way. It means a generational turnover in the organizations. Thomas Kuhn discusses um, the anatomy of a scientific revolution where he basically says that professors over the age of 30 don't change their minds. You grow up with one model and you're going to keep applying that model until you die in most cases. So there's a natural buffer of 10, 15, 20 years in organizations before they can begin to think about new ways of doing things. And finally, you wind up with, thank you, oh, where did it go? Um, the decentralization of the political capital. Um, the situation in Iraq is that because they're attempting to rebuild a centralized power grid and water grid in a war zone, they're failing. You just cannot protect what we call linear assets, things like pipelines or tree structured assets, things like a water grid, because you just can't have enough people to keep an eye on those systems to protect them. So the political implication of this radical decentralization is you generate a loan for hundreds of millions of dollars to a country to build their water infrastructure, and then it goes out into 20, 250,000 small grants. And that's a very different style of politics. It's a different way of handling the money. It's a different way of making the decisions. And that's going to take time to transform. Open source is just the beginning of a process. So um, let me come to the innovation gap. Um, humanitarian innovation is absolutely cash-starved and glacially slow, even though vast numbers of people were dying. And the reason is that there are structural impediments in the way that risk and money are handled in the humanitarian sector, which have ground innovation to a halt for four generations. Um, the example of innovation in a safety critical area that works is medical innovation. So if you're a doctor and you want to test a new medical procedure, you write up what it is you want to do, you write down why you think it'll work, and you take it to a medical ethics board. And the medical ethics board says, we are doctors, we're experts in the field, that is stupid. No. Experiment dead. If you come back to them and you rewrite the protocol and you say, you were right, that was stupid, this is not stupid, and they say, okay, now the Medical Ethics Board is responsible. They're like a court of law. They've taken responsibility for any risk implied in the study. They've said, you're doing a reasonable thing, go for it. Now, in the humanitarian world, there is no generally agreed on equivalent to the Medical Ethics Board. There's nowhere that you can go with an experiment in a humanitarian context and have somebody sign off and take responsibility for the experiment you want to conduct. Could you come poke it? And the result of this is that you wind up with an enormously slowed up rate of progress because there's no way to get ethical approval in a <coughs> unified way. You have to go and try and convince somebody in an organization who's got a bunch of field experience that what you're doing isn't daft. And if you make a mistake, it's now their career that's on the line and it's handled in an informal way, very problematic. Similarly, if you're a big NGO, typically speaking, you raise money to feed people or you raise money to do water stuff. If you take $100,000 and you put it into a research project on a technology and the technology turns out not to work in the field, people will turn around and say this money was wasted. Right? No, it wasn't wasted. We learned that this doesn't work. No, no, that's wasted. No, we, we learned it doesn't work. Right? The idea that you're funding failure, you're paying to discover that some things work and some things don't, isn't that the heart of medical research? 
right? But what's the equivalent structure in the humanitarian world? Who's going to give me some money to go out and try something that may not work, potentially harming people if it fails really badly? Nobody. But every single time you go to the doctor, you're sitting on top of hundreds of years of practice of that way of doing things. Medical innovation came by handling the ethical risks and funding failure. Um, and these questions about who owns the risk, ethical and financial, are at the heart of why humanitarian innovation is so slow. In the humanitarian sector, the risk is not clearly owned, so it's managed in informal ways. So this is the thing that I'm best known for. It's called a hexier. And um, have any of you ever done any construction? Raise your hands if you've uh, recently handled plywood. Okay? Okay. So the wall of this thing is a single sheet of plywood. You see the red square? Single sheet of plywood. The roof section is half a sheet of plywood cut on the diagonal. And uh, for our applications in a humanitarian context, probably you're going to put the thing together with little blocks of wood and a screw gun. It takes about two or three hours to build the first one with a new team. And after that, they can do one every hour and a half or maybe even an hour if it's a bunch of big guys. And the cost um, for a model that would work in Haiti is probably about $200. If you're in a less challenging environment, it might be $100 a unit. So 50% um, of the price of a relief tent, right? A relief tent is usually something like $350 plus another $100 for air freight. These things are about $100, and there's going to be another $100 of logistics charges and paying people to build them. So it's very cheap. It's multi-year life use. A tent will rot in three, six months in some climates, a year in others, but you certainly don't get two seasons out of a tent, whereas a hexier will last as long as plywood does in that environment, and that can be a number of years. What's going on? Right? Um, scalable local build, the locals do all of the construction themselves. You have teams that train them. Probably you would train with the military and then you'd have uh, the locals take over. You could design them ahead of time and then train ahead of time for areas like Bangladesh where you have repeating disasters. This is just a good way of doing things, right? Does this all kind of seem like it might be a promising approach to doing shelter? Cheap, easy, local build, durable, quite large. Seems like it'd be worth a dry. I've been trying to get people through a field test of this technology since 2002. Right? In eight years, having talked to something like two dozen of the world's leading humanitarian organizations and three or four different arms of the US government, I have succeeded in getting zero units tested. And that is not because I'm an ineffective human being, it's because nobody owns the risk. Right? I mean, I've done a lot of other things in that eight years, but, right? <laughs> Nobody owns the risk, so nobody's willing to try it. I talked to one specific National Red Cross, I'm not going to say which country, for three straight years about trying to get this thing tested in South America. It's $2,000 to get some built and leave them in somebody's backyard and see whether they blow over. Right? Hmm, <coughs> tricky. Because now, of course, we have this problem in Haiti, and this is where you see the payload, right? In Haiti right now, we have a million people most of whom would like to be under plastic sheets, but nobody's even given them plastic sheets yet. The current plan is to spend something between $1,000 and $3,000 per family, which will be $250 million to $750 million. That's a huge chunk of the reconstruction money just to build them transitional shelters, which are big wooden frames with sheet metal roofs on top. I think I can get reasonable quality sheltering for those people faster and for 10% of the cost of the current option. Right? But how's that going to work? I'm not an NGO. I'm not the kind of person to start an NGO. And the existing structures are not fast. And they haven't done the research already. Right? The saving grace in this is that Science for Humanity has picked up the design and is raising money to get the engineering done so that we can actually build a unit that will work for Haiti and show people a work example. But this is an example of the problem that you have when you do not build structures to absorb the risk of doing real research. This is critical. If we're going to make humanitarian innovation work, we have to build real structures to handle the risks of doing research, and we have to build real structures to fund failure. Because if we don't, we don't have the solutions when we need them. Um, this situation is inevitably going to change. There are real forces in play which are moving this forward. Um, you just saw Clay Shirky's talk. All of this stuff is really happening in the developing world. Have any of you seen the video of the African man who built a windmill from car parts? Right? Now, 
he's the first person who's done that kind of innovation in the field that I'd heard of, but I've been looking for that man for about 10 years. Right? What's going to happen very quickly is that the primary locus of humanitarian innovation is going to move from the developed world to the developing world. It's going to be the one in a million geniuses of whom there are 4,000 in the developing world sitting down with their new internet connections and publishing what they know and massively accelerating the space and time with which they have to think and cooperate to solve their own problems. They're going to take these little seeds that the NGOs and the governments have funded in the past few couple you know, decades. They're going to take those little seeds that we've built and they're going to pick that stuff up and run with it to places <coughs> that we cannot imagine. Um, there's a website called Apropedia, which is kind of the uh, canary in the mineshaft for this. It's the place where I watch for that power transfer happening. Apropedia has got about 10,000 articles and was arranged by a consortium of white males. Um, and there's five of these guys who are devoting their, you know, the bulk of their free time and a good chunk of their professional lives to building a wiki with appropriate technology. And they're just waiting and waiting and waiting for the transfer of responsibility and the transfer of workload to go from them, who are unsuited for the job because they don't live in the villages, to the village engineers who are coming out of the woodwork on all sides year by year by year by year. Barefoot solar engineers in India, the Barefoot College, the guy with his wind turbine, all of this stuff is the beginnings of the transfer of innovation in humanitarian arenas from a predominantly developed world activity funded by NGOs to primarily developing world activity funded by the people themselves. And what I would like to see is us develop a better way of helping these people along, both with technical resources and with grant funding. Um, does that sound like a good idea? We can help really foster these approaches, this, this, the decentralization and, and the absorption of risk by partnering with many different groups of different kinds to solve the real problem. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>